we have a big pleasure to have today a Ben Crafts talk. He will tell us about time periodicities in geographic safety. Safety. Okay, 45 minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much. So I would also like to start by thanking the organizers for setting up this very nice online workshop. So it's well known that a classical free scalar field in a background anti de Sitter space undergoes periodic evolution. Now, in the presence of small nonlinearities, for instance, a lambda phi to the fourth interaction, small corrections may build up over time and give rise to order one corrections on long time scales, which are inversely proportional to lambda. Now, remarkably, a few years ago, explicit solutions were found for which this slow modulation is also periodic. Now, assuming that such a system describes a holographically dual conformal field theory, at least in some regime, one may wonder what are the CFT counterparts of these periodicities. Now, it immediately follows from the holographic dictionary that the expectation value of the dual operator inherits the periodic behaviors. However, this only gives very rough information about the quantum states of the CFT. Now, we show that much more detailed information can be obtained by computing shifts of energy levels, or equivalently, anomalous dimensions of composite operators. And by making use of various symmetries of the slow dynamics, we find ladder structures in the order lambda anomalous dimensions of specific classes of operators with arbitrary, arbitrarily many particles. So in other words, we will find interesting structures in the anomalous dimensions, not only of the so-called double trace operators, but also of operators with arbitrarily many traces. Okay, so this link with holography is what I will get to at the end of the talk. And it's based on work in progress with my student Marine de Klerk and with Oleg Evnin. But before we get there, I will review a number of other results from the last few years. So consider a complex scalar field of arbitrary mass M with a cortic self-interaction lambda phi to the fourth in anti-de-sitter space with arbitrary dimension d plus one. We set the radius of ADS to one. And classically, we will consider scalar field profiles with amplitudes of order one. And we study how they evolve for a small coupling lambda. Now first consider the non-interacting limit where we put lambda equal to zero. In that case, the scalar field is a linear combination of normal modes with frequencies given in terms of delta, which is determined by the dimension and the mass, and with integer quantum numbers n and l. Here, n is the radial quantum number, l determines the magnitude of the angular momentum on the d minus one sphere, and k labels the harmonics that are contained in the l multiplet. And these uh, complex amplitudes A NLK and B NLK are constant if there's no interactions. Now notice one thing, which is that the any difference of two eigenfrequencies written here is integer. And that will give rise to many resonances in this problem. And that will play a crucial role for what follows. Okay, now when we turn on a small coupling lambda, the first thing to try is naive perturbation theory. Now, the problem is that resonances will lead to secular terms, which are terms in this phi correction that grow with time. So at times of order one over lambda, the order lambda term will compete with the order one term phi linear. So perturbation theory will become unreliable. Now, fortunately, there exist methods to resum the perturbation theory and to obtain results that are reliable even at timescales of order one over lambda. 
And the result of such an analysis is that the complex mode amplitudes, A and B, will develop slow time dependencies. And those slow time dependencies are governed by first order differential equations, which I will describe in more detail below. Okay, so let me illustrate these uh, secular terms and their resummation in a very simple example, namely the enharmonic oscillator. So we consider a particle in one dimension that oscillates in a quadratic potential that is perturbed by a small quartic uh, correction. So lambda is a small parameter here. The unperturbed solution X naught is a simple cosine. And the first order correction satisfies the equation of motion of a driven harmonic oscillator, where there's two driving frequencies. One is omega and the other is three omega. Now, the contribution from three omega is completely innocent. It's uniformly small for all times. So if we are happy to ignore corrections that remain of order lambda for all times, which I am happy to do, we can simply throw away the driving term with frequency three omega. Now, in contrast, this other driving term with frequency omega uh, is more dangerous because that one is at resonance and it gives rise to a secular term. And this secular term will cause perturbation theory to break down at time scales of order one over lambda. So here you see the secular term that grows with T. So if T becomes of order one over lambda, the second term becomes comparable to the first and perturbation theory breaks down. So what we need is a better way to take into account this uh, resonant contribution. So let us drop the non-resonant order lambda contribution with frequency three omega, because it remains small for all times. And we're also ignoring contributions of higher order in lambda, which can only become significant on time scales of order one over lambda squared, which is much longer than the order one over lambda time scales that we are interested in. Now, the secular term, which you see here, can be absorbed in a time-dependent shift of the phase B of the zeroth order solution. Now, because the shift is linear in time, it's equivalent to a small shift of the frequency of the oscillator, which you see here. Now, this is called a poincare lindstedt frequency shift, and it can be shown that the result of doing this is reliable on time scales of order one over lambda up to corrections that are themselves suppressed by lambda. So they're of order lambda to be more precise. Now let me make a few comments about what happened here. So first notice that because of the frequency shift of order lambda, if one waits a time of order one over lambda, the perturbed and the unperturbed solutions may be completely out of phase. So the perturbation has an order one effect on those time scales. And this is only possible because of the resonance. Otherwise, the perturbation would remain of order lambda for all times. The second comment is that not all nonlinearities have to give rise to secular terms at order lambda. For instance, if we had added a cubic potential to the harmonic oscillator rather than a quartic potential, the driving frequencies would be even multiples of omega and therefore not at resonance with omega itself. A third comment, given that we are considering a single one dimensional oscillator, the resonance necessarily came about in a very simple way, namely, uh, the driving frequency omega equals omega plus omega minus omega for a single frequency omega. Now, in a system with multiple 
oscillators, it's possible that additional resonances emerge because of non-trivial relations between the frequencies of several oscillators. And this is the case for weakly coupled fields in anti-desitter space for which the unperturbed frequencies are integer up to a common shift, as we've seen before. Now, as a fourth comment, the fact that for the anharmonic oscillator, the secular term could be absorbed in the phase B is due to its T times sine structure, which you see here. And this structure is, is due to the simple omega plus omega minus omega pattern in which the resonance emerged. For resonances involving multiple oscillators, the phases will generically not work out in this way, and the amplitude of the unperturbed oscillator will also pick up a time dependence. So it will not only be the phase that picks up a time dependence, but also the amplitude A. All right, having made these comments, let's uh, move on. So throwing away the small non-resonant contributions can also be done at the level of the Hamiltonian. And that is by the so-called averaging method. First, one goes to the quote unquote interaction picture by writing Hamiltonian in terms of A and A bar rather than X and P, where A and A bar are defined in the usual way over here. This involves a canonical transformation that is induced by the unperturbed Hamiltonian, and that removes the quadratic part of the Hamiltonian. Now this makes sense because in the absence of the quartic interaction, A and A bar would be simply constant. So the new Hamiltonian should indeed vanish for lambda equals zero. The X to the fourth interaction now splits up in a number of terms, which you see here, most of which oscillate fast compared to the time scale on which A and A bar are expected to evolve. Now, by removing those terms, one ends up with the so-called resonant Hamiltonian written here. And one can indeed check that the remaining interaction term is the only one contributing to the resonant driving term that we saw before. So the slow evolution of A and A bar is governed by the Hamiltonian HRS. Now, an interesting point also for what follows is that the number operator A bar A has vanishing Poisson bracket with the resonant Hamiltonian, as you can easily see from the expression, but not with the original Hamiltonian, which you can also easily see. The interpretation is that particle number, and therefore the unperturbed Hamiltonian, is not conserved under the exact evolution, but the violations are small, namely of order lambda, on time scales of order one over lambda. So we can consistently ignore them. Now, there are mathematical theorems that guarantee that the difference between the exact evolution and the averaged evolution remains of order lambda for time scales of order one over lambda. So the approximation we are doing is really a controlled approximation. Okay, now let us return to the self-interacting scalar in ADS. And for simplicity, I will specialize to ADS4 so that I can write the angular coordinates explicitly. And I will label the modes by N, L, and M instead of N, L, and the collective index K. Now, conceptually, the procedure to study the slow evolution of the modes alpha and beta is very similar to what we've just discussed, except that now there's an infinite number of modes as well as many non-trivial resonances. Now, by using the averaging method, we can derive a resonant Hamiltonian for the modes alpha NLM, beta NLM, and their complex conjugates. And the result 
the, the resonant Hamiltonian exhibits enhanced symmetries, which allow us to consistently set the betas equal to zero. Now, this would not be possible when considering evolution with exact Hamiltonian, but the difference is controllably small for times up to order one over lambda. Now, the slow evolution of the alphas is then governed by a first order differential equation where the coefficients c are integrals of products of mode functions. And this is the same structure we would have gotten for the n-harmonic oscillator by using its resonant Hamiltonian. So what we want to do next is truncate the system to a one index family of modes so that things become more manageable. So to do that, consider an initial condition such that the only modes that are excited are those with maximal angular momentum around the polar axis. This implies that the surviving alphas have the quantum number n equal to L and n equal to zero, so that we can label these maximally rotating modes by a single index m. And the dimension, as you can see from this formula, is then simply given by delta plus m. Now the claim is that if we start with only such modes, the resonant evolution will never induce the resonant dynamics to maximally rotating modes. To see this, the rotation symmetry will imply that the interaction coefficient c will vanish unless m1 plus m2 is equal to m3 plus m4. That's just conservation of angular momentum. Now the resonance condition, which you see here, says that omega one plus omega two is equal to omega three plus omega four. And then it immediately follows that if omega equals delta plus m for all the modes on the right-hand side, the same will be the case for the modes on the left-hand side. And therefore, if all other modes were set to zero, you will never induce a non-maximally rotating mode. So therefore, we can truncate the evolution equation to maximally rotating modes labeled by one index m. Again, this is only a feature of the resonant approximation in the exact dynamic that would not be possible, but the mistake we are making is controllably small, so I will uh, ignore it. All right, so then we end up with this last equation with still an infinite number of oscillators, but only a one parameter family of them. So now it turns out that if one makes an ansatz written here, which involves three complex functions of time, namely A, B, and P, then one can check by brute force that this ansatz is respected by the evolution equation. So the time dependence of an infinite number of functions alpha n is reduced to that of just three functions a, b, and p. And we refer to this as an invariant manifold because it is uh, preserved under the evolution with the resonant Hamiltonian. Now, by analyzing the dynamics on this invariant manifold, which can be explicitly done, one finds slow energy transfer between the various mode amplitudes which happens to be periodic on time scales of order one over lambda. And such exactly periodic energy transfers on those time scales are quite remarkable. We actually originally stumbled upon such invariant manifolds by numerically evolving the evolution equation for the modes themselves, and that was for a related system, and observing striking periodic behavior that suggested some simple solution. And then we found this pattern. So seeing this, two questions immediately come to mind. The first question is, where do they come from, these remarkable solutions? And the second question is, do these solutions have an interesting holographic interpretation?
maybe I, before I go to the next point, maybe I should pause to see if there's any questions so far. All right, if not, let's uh, move on. So before addressing the questions I've just raised, let me make an observation that connects this ADS story in a simple way to a completely different area of physics. If one takes the field equation of the system we are studying and takes a specific non-relativistic limit indicated here, then one ends up with the gross pitiavsky equation in a harmonic trap. This equation describes the dynamics of Bose-Einstein condensates, and we have indeed found similar periodic energy returns on long time scales in systems that are described by a weakly coupled gross pitiavsky equation. And in fact, there is now a rather long list of systems for which such solutions have been found. The first in the list was a system without obvious physical interpretation, which was studied by mathematicians. And this system actually turned out to be integrable. And uh, after learning about this, we suspected for some time that similarly, there might be integrability underlying the other periodic energy modulations that we had found, but that turned out not to be the case, as I will tell you later. Now, I will not go through the whole list, but um, for the gross pitayevsky equation, the truncation to the maximally rotating sector, so analogous to what we've just seen, is called the lowest Landau level truncation. And I will say a little bit more about uh, that system right now. So this picture describes the motion of a single vortex in a two-dimensional Bose-Einstein condensate in a harmonic trap, an isotropic harmonic trap, I should say. The solution is in the maximally rotating lowest lambda level sector. And in the picture, you see that the vortex rotates fast with the trap frequency around the center of the trap. And this fast motion is superposed on a slow modulation. And if we went to a frame that rotates with a condensate, the modulation would be described by this red circle. So superposing the fast rotation around the center with a slow motion around the red circle gives this uh, green out spiraling and the blue in spiraling trajectories. So, so this ben, is, yes. A magnetic field because you're talking of Landau levels or? No, this is, a, this is some, this is a rotating, um, this is a rotating plasma and the effect of the rotation oh, is similar okay. to that of a magnetic field. Okay. So it's, it's critically rotating. So the um, centrifugal forces will exactly compensate the, the harmonic trap that the um, regime for which this is a, a controlled solution. Okay, thank you. All right, so now let's go back to the maximum rotating waves in ADS and for simplicity ADS4 although the restriction to four dimensions is not essential at all. So a first observation is that the resonant Hamiltonian has a number of conserved uh, charges. And this will help in explaining where these uh, very special solutions that we found uh, come from. So in addition to the angular momentum M, so total angular momentum, um, it also, the, the resonant Hamiltonian also conserves the particle number n, which you see here. And the latter is a feature of the resonant approximation, which we also saw for the anharmonic oscillator. And finally, although we were not aware of them when we first studied this system, there are additional conserved charges, z and z bar. 
and they commute with a number operator, as you can see from their structure, but they act as ladder operators for the total angular momentum, as you can also easily see from their structure. Now, it turns out that conserved charges like Z and Z bar appear in all the resonant systems in which three dimensional invariant manifolds and periodic energy flows have been found. And recently, it's been realized that they can be traced back to so called breathing modes of the original Hamiltonian. So, the Hamiltonian before we did the resonant approximation. Now, breathing modes are special observables that evolve periodically for all solutions. So for instance, for a system of particles in a harmonic potential with translationally invariant interactions, the center of mass motion is known to decouple and to evolve periodically. Now the corresponding generators depend on time and they do not commute with the Hamiltonian, it's a bit like boost uh, generators. But it turns out that under certain, certain uh, circumstances, they do commute with the resonant Hamiltonian for which they become ordinary conserved charges. So the breathing mode for center of mass motion in a harmonic potential underlies a conserved charge Z for the LLL resonant Hamiltonian. And similarly, for relativistic fields in anti sitter there is a breeding mode for the center of mass motion, which explains the conserved charge Z for our resonant Hamiltonian. So the existence of this breeding mode has to do with uh, the isometries of anti sitter space. So one could expect that their presence is a rather robust uh, feature. And I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Okay, so now let's move on to quantum mechanics. Now, a few years ago, it was asked what happens if one simply takes a classical resonant Hamiltonian and interprets it as a quantum Hamiltonian. And in this paper, uh, techniques from quantum chaos theory were used to study level spacings uh, numerically. Um, and um, it was pointed out that that could be used to learn about integral nature or not of these systems. Now, subsequently, it was realized that there's actually a much more direct link between resonant Hamiltonians and quantum mechanics, namely via standard textbook quantum mechanical perturbation theory. In first order time independent perturbation theory, one has to diagonalize the interaction Hamiltonian between states of the same unperturbed energy. So matrix elements between states with different unperturbed energy levels do not play any role at first order in the coupling. Now this means that for the purpose of first order perturbation theory, one can simply replace the Hamiltonian by the resonant Hamiltonian because the resonance condition precisely keeps the terms that do not change the unperturbed energy, as we've seen, for instance, for the enharmonic oscillator. Now, this correspondence makes sense because quantum mechanically, time evolution on time scales of order the inverse coupling is indeed governed by energy shifts of order the coupling. Now, Frank Lindstedt energy shifts, which we've seen for the enharmonic oscillator, can now be interpreted as the energy shifts of non degenerate quantum mechanical perturbation theory. The absence of a frequency shift for a harmonic oscillator perturbed by lambda x cubed potential corresponds to the vanishing expectation value of x cubed in harmonic oscillator eigenstates, and that's simply because of parity. And the energy transfer between modes that occurs in the presence of non-trivial resonances 
that corresponds to the diagonalization problem that one has to do in degenerate quantum mechanical perturbation theory. It was also found that the conserved charges Z and Z bar, which can be traced back to the isometries of ADS, lead to a rich algebraic structure. And this structure simplified the computations of energy shifts. And by using techniques from quantum chaos theory, uh, it's been possible to show that there is actually no sign of integrability beyond the already identified conserved charges. So the original intuition that these uh, very special um, energy, periodic energy returns had to do with some underlying integrable structure turned out to be uh, not realized. All the charges that we've seen so far are sufficient. So the structure has recently also been used to construct families of shifted energies and the corresponding explicit eigenstates for this lowest lambda level system. actually nicely explain the periodicities of the classical solutions we have seen before. There was the fast rotations explained by these integers E0 and uh, superposed on the slow periodic modulations, um, which uh, had a frequency um, G divided by four, which is explained by this uh, perturbatively small ladder of shifted energies. Um, so what has been done in addition to that is reproduce the behavior of the classical solutions by explicitly uh, constructing coherent uh, like states from the explicit uh, quantum mechanical eigenstates that were constructed for the system. Okay, with all these uh, backgrounds, now we can finally make the link with uh, holography. So let's imagine that our self-interacting scalar field theory in ADS is dual to some holographic conformal field theory. Now, strictly speaking, this cannot be quite correct because we did not study gravity in anti sitter space. So the would be dual theory would not even have a stress tensor. Now there's uh, three reasons to continue anyway within our probe field uh, setup. First, we can view it as a toy model for holography. And this was also done for instance in the holography from conformal field theory paper by Heims, Kerk, Penadonis, Polchinski and Sully. Second, we could imagine that our model describes a sector of an honest holographic uh, model where a scalar field simply interacts more strongly with itself than with gravity and gravity can be ignored for certain purposes. And this was actually given us additional motivation in the same paper and it has actually been used a lot in the literature. As a third motivation for going ahead, the robust origin of the conserved charges Z and Z bar, which are related to the symmetries of ADS, actually make us hopeful that there will be generalizations to maximally rotating sectors of actual gravitational systems, which would be much closer to actual uh, holographic CFDs. So anyway, let us uh, go ahead. So first free fields in ADS, correspond to so-called generalized free fields in the dual conformal field theory. And those are operators whose correlation functions factorize. This is usually uh, because of some large N factorization or similar effects. So a Fox space in ADS corresponds to a Fox space of, uh, of CFT, of the CFT on the sphere. And the 
energies in radial quantization of the CFT correspond to conformal dimensions in the CFT. Now, when one introduces weak interactions in ADS, one can compute energy shifts of the Fox space uh, states, and those therefore correspond to anomalous dimensions, to shifts of the dimensions in the CFT. Now, our computations of anomalous dimensions, they will have the restriction that they are at linear order in the coupling, because nothing I told you before went beyond linear order in lambda. And also that we only compute them for certain classes of operators, namely those corresponding to the explicit quantum states uh, that have been constructed or that we have constructed for the ADS, for the ADS case. So those are some restrictions, but the, our computations also have the benefits that they can handle operators with arbitrarily many particles. So in particular, they are not restricted to the two particle or so-called double trace operators for which there is a large literature on anomalous dimensions because the anomalous dimensions of two particle operators appear in conformal block decompositions of the well-studied four point functions of single particle operators. Now, as in the already mentioned work on the lowest Landau level system by my collaborators, we have computed specific energy shifts and the corresponding eigenstates for a cortic scalar in AVS, as well as coherent like superpositions that reproduce the classical solutions with periodic energy transfer that we saw before. A notable difference with the LLL case is that the energy shifts are more complicated. Namely, the splitting involves not a single uh, ladder, but two incommensurate ladders instead of one. And this is actually related to a fact I haven't told you about yet, namely that for LLL, all our classical solutions had a common modulation period, whereas for a scalar in ADS, the period is actually state dependent. That's something we know from the uh, classical solutions. So one actually needs more complicated splitting patterns to accommodate uh, that structure. Okay, and as mentioned Sorry, already- a uh, question. What does it mean, state dependent? Uh, for, so this is about, um, actually for a classical system, so it means that um, you find periodic solutions which have a certain period and that period can depend on conserved charges for instance which depend on the initial conditions that you chose for the classical field thank you um, so harmonic oscillator would be an example where this does not happen because everything oscillates with frequency omega um, but for other systems this can this can happen Okay, so as mentioned already, we hope on general grounds that um, the general generalization to gravitational systems will be possible because both the breathing modes seem to be quite generic and also the possibility to truncate to a maximally symmetric sector seems to be quite uh, generic. Uh, so it would be very nice to do that, although it will be technically uh, significantly more complicated than the computations uh, done so far. Okay, I will not give you more details about this. Uh, let me just uh, conclude by saying that we studied lambda phi to the fourth theory in ADS, uh, in particular the maximally rotating uh, sector where we found solutions with slow periodic modulation, the period of order one over the coupling um, of the fast oscillations with period of order one. And we studied uh, this system by using averaging methods or equivalently by using a resonant Hamiltonian. The quantum mechanical counterpart of uh, working with resonant Hamiltonians corresponds to the study of order lambda energy shifts in textbook uh, perturbation theory. And we found a rich algebraic structure 
that made the problem manageable, which originates from isometries of anti Sitter space. So in particular, patterns in the order lambda anomalous dimensions were found for classes of operators with arbitrarily many particles. And uh, finally, uh, we explicitly constructed coherent like quantum states that reproduce these periodic energy transfers in the classical solutions that we wanted to understand better. Okay, with this, uh, let me end. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your interesting Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Any questions, please? Uh, let me ask a question. Uh, so, uh, how uh, many of these states uh, which you describe in holographic CFT might be present in a non-holographic CFT? Uh, that I have no idea about. Uh, so everything we did crucially uses uh, the structures that come from ADS. Um, and it uses computations of energy levels in ADS. So um, it also uses the fact that you have the generalized free fields. Um, so I don't know if you could cook up some non-holographic CFT that had features like uh, like that, some things might still go through, but I'm I'm not sure. Right away. I would expect that uh, at least some part of this results uh, might come uh, from the fact uh, from the arrangement of the uh, representations of the conformal group. Uh, in the that, that, that's right. So this right. So this uh, Z and Z bar are actually very similar to the raising and lowering operators of the conformal dimension in the in the conformal group. Absolutely. And so, for instance, um, the special states that we constructed were actually annihilated by uh, Z-bar. The, the conventions are a bit unfortunate because Z-bar is the annihilation operator, but we had identified and given them names before we realized uh, their, their role. Um, so those correspond to conformal primaries in, uh, in a dual CFT. So indeed, the symmetry structure of ADS and therefore the conformal group plays an important role. So that I agree with. Okay. More Can I ask a question? Um, as far as I know, there is still some uh, confusion about the standard story of the instability of ADS and uh, the fact that different classes of initial conditions may give different answers. Does the study of these systems give you any hint about what may be happening there? Not directly. Uh, so one could ask whether there exist similar periodic energy flows in ADS. And we were actually looking for them. And for some time, we thought we had found some uh, via some numerical work. But then it turned out that they were like almost perfect returns but there was some numerically small deviation which we could actually understand analytically that it was a real deviation so for now um, we haven't found analogs of this like in the usual spherically symmetric uh, setups that people study in the aid when they look at the ADS instability problem typically however as I mentioned in the talk if we were able to focus on a different sector namely the maximally rotating one then we believe we are in better shape to find features like this. Um, and okay, people are now working and already have some results on generalizing the setup for ADS instability. So including gravity beyond spherically symmetric uh, setups, but it's technically much more complicated than the spherically symmetric uh, setup. Now, if assuming that we found solutions with uh, periodic energy 
returns like this one, I don't think it would solve the uh, ADS instability question because we already know uh, that there exists that there exists part of parameter space where you will not form black holes. Um, so by finding periodic uh, solutions like that, it would just confirm that there exist uh, periodic solutions, but we already knew, know that there exist solutions that do not collapse. I don't think it would shed light on the other question, which is, are there regions in parameter space such that for arbitrarily small amplitude, you do form a black hole? But uh, the collapse of solutions, of course, is eventually done numerically. And as you remember, one question is whether such solutions would collapse if you wait long enough. So having an argument that some of them will never do is at least something. Yes, but that we, that we have already, because uh, as I told you, the, well, okay, at least on time scales of order one over the coupling, we have uh, reliable results there, because if the evolution equations that you get from the resonant system um, stays small, then you know that in the exact solution, the same will happen. Of course, we do not know for sure what will happen on parametrically longer time scales like one over lambda squared and, and so on. So that we do not know yet, but I think there is strong evidence that at least on the time scales of order one over lambda, there will be some non-collapsing solutions. I think the other question of proving that there will be collapse for arbitrarily small perturbations, that is intrinsically more difficult because by definition, you cannot do it during numerics because you cannot go to arbitrarily small data. Um, and um, and perturbatively, you will also lose control at some point because if you approach black hole formation, you will lose control in your perturbation theory before you get there. Thank you. Irina, I think you are muted. Sorry, sorry. Okay, um, I have a, a small question. Have you tried to consider a Tachyonic case? I ask you because several years ago, we considered a very similar problem, but in context of cosmology. So in our case, we deal with the sitter, which is uh, in some sense different, but in any case, there are very interesting uh, results for uh, the Hyonic case. Just take uh, a mass uh, uh, square negative in your case. Mm -hmm. Um, from the top of my head, I'm not sure if, um, as long as they are above the BF bound, uh, from the top of my head, I don't think much will change to what I've said. I don't think I've restricted to positive M squared. I would have to think more carefully, but from the top of my head, that would be my answer. Um, okay. Certainly the resonances are still there, so I don't yes, think yes, anything with it depends on the sign of M squared. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. More question, please. Yeah, hi, Ben, I have a question. Hi, Alex. Um, so from the CFT point of view, there's typically two things that give anomalous dimensions to multi-trace operators. There's things like quartic couplings, which is what you considered, but there's also the exchange of operators. And one that's always going to happen is the exchange of the stress tensor. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, do you have a bulk? Can you use your bulk tools to try to understand the anomalous dimensions induced by the coupling to gravity? Well, for, um, for that, we would first need to be able to treat the gravitational field in ADS, right? Which I said is something we're hoping to do someday, but uh, is technically more complicated. So once you had that, uh, I'm pretty sure it, it is possible because the anomalous dimensions of CFT operators are nothing but the shifts um, of the energy levels that you would compute in quantum mechanical perturbation theory. So, okay, at least at linear order in interactions, that's simple. Of course, if you're gonna talk about effects that are higher order, 
in the coupling, um, then it will become more complicated, right? Because all the simplifications I told you about were using the fact that uh, it was like first order perturbation theory. Right, that's why I'm asking, because from the exchange point of view, it looks, it looks a little bit more like second order in the sense that it's kind of quadratic yes. in the... Um... Right, yeah, so I don't have uh, things to say about that for now, right. Maybe just a quick follow-up question. Um, and what about mm -hmm. corrections to OPE coefficients? Because that's the other part of the data that changes. You know, like O, O, O squared, that OPE coefficient gets affected at order one over N squared. Um, yes, but that, but that gets affected precisely by the shift in the, uh, in the dimension, right? So it is the anomalous dimension that appears there, right? Uh, so the... No, I thought that was, well, I mean, everything gets mixed together in some way, but I thought it was in principle independent data, is it not? No, 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 because uh, like factorizing these four point functions is one of the standard ways that people compute uh, anomalous dimensions of uh, two particle operators. Um, and it actually was um, realized in the literature um, on, on conformal bootstrap and things like that, that an alternative way to computing four point functions and factorizing them was actually to use um, perturbation theory uh, to, to compute uh, shifts of energy levels. So I think they are the same. Well, I, I'm a bit confused because I really thought there's two things. There's the dimension of the operator O squared, and then there's the OPE coefficient of how it couples to the to two single trace operators O. And typically when you do one over N perturbation theory, you expand both. You know, the anomalous right. dimensions give you logs, but the other ones give you just power logs. Ah, okay. I was I was talking about the, the log terms in the in the in that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so okay, I was asking sorry. whether you can, you know, also extract the the change ah. in the OPE coefficients. Ah okay, okay. Now I see what you mean. Um not that I'm aware of, but I haven't really thought about it. Okay, thanks. More questions, please. If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. <laughs>